worship tonight is from the first four verses of Psalm 19. We think about the rain falling, the changing temperatures, the various uh, weathers that we've been the privileged and had the privilege of experiencing. The psalmist writes, the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the earth. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It's rising to the ends of the heaven, and its circuit to the ends of them. Let the words of my mouth, O Lord, and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. Let us worship God and pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the glory of your presence, for your spirit that runs in us and through us, giving us strength, giving us hope, and most of all, giving us joy. May we experience all of that tonight as we worship together. May we draw near to you as you have drawn near to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We've had experience. Why don't you explain I'm yeah, well, going to um, give just a testimony of our junior high weekend. Um, last weekend, we went up um, to uh, United Christian Youth Camp up in Prescott. Uh, five junior hires, and me and my husband Rob, and it was.
Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. He, they said, Is this not Joseph's son? <coughs> I'm sure that when Jesus began his ministry following his baptism and the temptations that he went through, he had a list of things that he hoped he could get done. And those are listed in those short verses from Isaiah. And I have a feeling he did a better job dealing with resolutions than we sometimes do in the new year. And Jamie has a few words that she'd like to share with us about that tonight. So, Jamie. Well, now that Christmas is over and that everything I asked for was given to me, well, it's time for me to start on a new list. I mean, one list that's not so easily done. A few weeks ago, my youth leader asked me to create a list of three things that I wanted to see change in the new year. I mean, I don't understand why she has to challenge me like that. I mean, I get the church answer. It's to bring me closer to God, but still, another list? I mean, what a concept. My parents still ask me to make a Christmas list for them, and it gets done. And I get what I asked for. But this one is a little different. This isn't something that I can just hand off to somebody else and be done with. This is me putting down on paper things that I want to see happen. Which scares me a little bit, because I know me. I don't exactly get stuff done on time. I mean, I, I found my list from last year that I made on my living room floor on New Year's Eve. That was fun. I will read it to you. My resolution is 2012 were fit into skinny jeans. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. Um, second one, make straight A's. That's closer to that. That's hard for anybody, okay? I didn't, I didn't quite get to straight A's last year, but no one can do that. Except for this girl who sits next to me. She's always like, look what I got in biology. I got an A. It was good. She's a perfect example of why animals eat their young. <laughs> Number three was Megan's kid, Jason, noticed me. I mean, I'm sure you can all guess that that didn't quite happen either. I mean, one time I thought he was waving at me, so I did that thing, and he like waved and he smiled back, and then I realized that he was waving to his friend who was behind me. Yeah, I felt like a work. So, I didn't really attain or achieve anything that I set out to last year. And it wasn't even about God, really. And I realized that it's a God thing that my youth leader asked me to do this year. So I've decided to do it again. I've written down three things that I want to see change this year. I've taken a little bit of a different approach to it, and I don't know if it'll work, but if we don't try to change, what do we become? So I was looking on the internet for a quote, maybe some inspiration, and I came across this. One does not discover new lands unless you consent to leave the shore for a very, very, very long time. I mean, that sounds like something Christopher Columbus would say, but it got me thinking. You don't find new lands without consenting. And I googled that too. That means to agree after thoughtful consideration. I'm going to discover new lands with my new list. I'm going to put thoughtful consideration into it, because what else am I going to do at the weekend? I mean, we all get bored. So, this is my list. Top three dreams for the new year. I will surrender to the fact that I... Oh, you know what? Maybe we can talk about this in a year. <laughs> <laughs> Putting these dreams on paper makes it a little too real. I need to walk the walk before I can talk the talk. And I know that sounds churchy or cliche, but that's what I have to do. But since I have to share this with my youth group anyways, I'll tell you that my ultimate dream is to make God famous. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I want to figure it out. I mean, with my gifts and talents, I can at least try to get a seed of insight to grow on for the next year. So whether your list is in your head, on paper, or in your heart, Pray for me, and I will pray for you, and together we can do God things. All the words that Jamie 
we share the most important one right at the end, together. Uh, as the family of faith, we are a community that comes together by the call of God to help out one another, just as Jamie talked about, being together, strengthening one another, supporting one another, knowing that we're not alone in that quest to keep those resolutions, to do the God thing. We're there to support and strengthen one another, no matter what our ages are, and I think we do a great job of that here, of bringing folks from whatever age they might be, from youth to adult, to be supportive and strengthening one another in that walk of faith, because we do it together. We gather together here, we gather together in small groups, we gather together around food tables very well. <laughs> we gather together. And sometimes we gather at the river.
has always been the fascinating one for me, but especially that section of the passage where Luke writes, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. What comes to your mind when you hear the word hometown? Some of the thoughts that pop into your head. Which is not Kansas, okay? <laughs> Family? Okay. What else? Country, uh, as in out in the? Yeah. Okay. Small town. Small town? Okay. Comfort? Yeah. I think about comfortable foods growing up, you know, that's before I started experimenting with weird and wild foods that I didn't know why I was eating. <laughs> Meat, potatoes, and gravy. Yeah. Small town attitude, I think about um, being accepted, but yet at the same time, always having to prove yourself. You know, uh, there was kind of like a family culture class system in all small towns. There were the, I think about my small town, there, there, there were the country club set, folks said. Those uh, there was the yeah. folks that run the school book. There were all these all these layers of people in authority, and sometimes there were the ins and the outs and all those sort of things. There were Lutherans. <laughs> there were Catholics, and there were Presbyterians, and there were Methodists. There, there's a whole church culture in my hometown. I was talking to a friend the other day and uh, on the internet from my hometown, and we were just talking about ministry and growing up in that town, and I, and I confess to him that I still to this day have not been to the Catholic Church or in the Lutheran Church in my hometown. Because growing up, we did things with the Methodists, and we did things with the, the Church of Christ, but we didn't do things with the Lutherans and the Catholics because they were kind of off on their own. And that's, I've been in Catholic churches in all the towns that I've served churches in, but I've never been to the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church in my hometown. I'm going to have to do something about that on my next visit home. I also, when I think about hometown, I think about the first sermon I ever delivered. My mother keeps things. <laughs> Here's the, the manuscript from the first sermon that I ever delivered. And, uh, I'm not going to put you through it. <laughs> so I felt like uh, I could relate a little bit to... Jesus' experience, one of the few times I can relate to Jesus going back to his hometown. You just never know, you know, I think I've been away at college for a couple of years and coming back into your hometown to, to preach. Um, and that's what Jesus did, coming back to his hometown to give his first sermon. It's interesting that Luke should point out that um, Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. And he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. You know, as long as he was outside the boundaries of Nazareth where he grew up, boy, people really loved what he had to say. He could not go wrong. He had the countryside at his feet. I wonder, though, if we would have been in Nazareth and in the synagogue when Jesus, the homeboy, came back and came into the synagogue, and he was invited to stand up to read. If you were in the synagogue on that day, what sort of things would have gone through your mind? Not knowing what we know about Jesus now, what would you have been thinking? This is the part where it gets interactive. <laughs> they do what this in you, contemporary what services. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Who do you think? Yeah. Well, and we got a little bit of a hint of that. Isn't this Joseph's son? Yeah. My thought would be, where did he get that? On the other hand, what might be your expectation? Because word would have gotten around about this whole Bethlehem deal. You know those shepherds wouldn't have kept it under the, under the hat. You know, that word would have spread, and I don't, we don't have, that's what it gets interesting. We have no idea what took place in Jesus' life between the time when he was dedicated to the temple and when he was 12 years old, and then again, we don't hear anything again until he's uh, 
called on him to baptize him out into the wilderness to be tempted. We have no idea what sort of a neighbor Jesus might have been, what sort of a schoolmate Jesus might have been, what sort of a kid in the neighborhood Jesus might have been. So they may have had some expectations of some great things happening. You know. Um, like I said, all the other places where he went uh, praised his teachings. Now, what do you think would have been Jesus' expectations coming back home? He was, yeah, yeah, here I am. I'm, I'm home. Mom, Dad, I'm home. Expecting perhaps a warm welcome. Um, then he rolled out the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And then, as now, there was a set prescribed list of scriptures that were read Sabbath day by Sabbath day. I don't believe there are any coincidences that. On that particular day, the appointed reading was from the prophet Isaiah. And he unrolled it. And it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed me to, do, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, if I was in the synagogue, I would have heard those words. Year by year, time after time, they would have been part of the lectionary that had been preached on by the rabbis from little on up. And there would have been an anticipation that, yeah, those words are there, but nothing's changed. You know, we are still under the thumb of the Romans. Uh, the religious folks, the good folks, oppress us. We're looking around, our neighborhoods are still poor. We still feel like captives. When is anything going to change? And we, even with Jesus reading these, I'm sure there are folks who, well, it's that time of the year for that passage to be read again. And we sometimes feel that way as we go through a cycle of, of, of scriptures through the course of the church here that the Pentecost passage comes around and we're all excited about the coming of the Holy Spirit, but has anything changed since last year? And I'm sure they were asking themselves the same question. Has anything really changed? But those are the resolutions that Jesus chose for his ministry. And I think as we look at the ministry of, of the Christian church today, for whatever else we choose to do, for whatever else we feel the Spirit is calling us to do, these are the main things that I believe Jesus calls the gathered Christian community to be about. Bringing good news to the poor. Releasing the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Is that done yet? No. The passage does not promise that the, the events will all take place, simply that the Spirit has appointed Jesus to bring the good news. The Spirit has appointed all of us to bring the good news. We're not sure when all this is going to take place. We're not sure when the last captive is going to be set free, when the last poor person is going to be lifted up and receiving the good news. We don't know when any of that is going to happen. We're just called upon to proclaim it. Things have changed with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. God has begun already to bring that new creation about. We're in the middle of it right now. We've been in the middle of it since Jesus ascended. The church has been put here to continue that message to continue proclaiming the good news. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know how it's going to happen. We just believe that it is. But caring for the poor, making sure that the oppressed are <coughs> lifted up, that the captives are set free, to proclaim the good news of the year of the Lord. Um, his ministry was all about reaching out to those people who are marginalized in the world and sharing with them that God loves them too. The outsiders are going to be invited in. Now, the story goes on. And we're going to talk about this particular passage tomorrow. But next Sunday, 
a week from tomorrow we have the rest of the story. We, this part concludes with all spoke well of him. And some started to kind of complain a little bit, saying, is this not Joseph's son? And then people got to think, hey, yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> and then Jesus gives his eight or nine word first sermon. Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> so, what does the Lord require of us? What are we called to do in our hometowns, wherever we've grown comfortable, wherever we've felt like we're divided or marginalized? It's all about community and coming together and supporting one another, strengthening one another, lifting one another up to do and proclaim the good news of God and Jesus Christ. Amen. As we gather together today, we share in an offering as we always do when we worship together, considering the blessings God has given to us and saying thank you to God with the gifts that we share. So, here is going to be an offertory play and we're going to share that together and uh, offering plates and then we're going to receive an offering for us tonight. <coughs>
and share our lives with one another. We also pray for one another. And so at this time, as we come to the close of this service tonight, I would invite you to share any prayer, concerns, or joys that you might have. Uh, as we pray together, I want to share a, few, a couple of things with you. Um, if you haven't heard, Bob and Mary got stables. Um, Bob's son was living with them, passed away overnight, and they just discovered that this morning, and so they're dealing with some very um, troubled times in their household right now, so Bob and Mary Beth both appreciate your prayers, they're very sudden and unexpected. So we lift up Bob and Mary Beth. Uh, Jan is home this evening with a terrible head cold and trying to get things clear so that she can uh, think clearly and, and speak, <laughs> speak plainly, so I appreciate some prayers for her recovery. <coughs> Joys or concerns that you might have to lift up and share tonight? Yes, Sherry. Um, my dad's sister uh, met my aunt and in the hospital in New York, and just a matter of time, so just prayers for her and prayers for St. Edith. Edith, okay. Edith Brown. Yes, our okay, for Shirley Curse. She's got a bad cold also. She's in the season. Mm -hmm. Yes. My friend Phyllis has learned of a drug that might uh, help treat her lymphoma that is plaguing her, and she was in hospice when she learned of this. And she Gail. Gail's home. Yeah. Sickness too, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll have a Major headache. Major, Major headache. headache. Thank you for the room. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the I'm always intrigued watching those barrel cactuses just fill up and suck up. It's a great image, a great uh, gift God's given to us to see. We had uh, the meetings of both Arizona Presbyteries met together this weekend in Mesa, and uh, from noon until 9 o'clock last night, and from 8.30 until about 12.30 this morning, and had a great time together, and there's some exciting things happening on that level, too. I'm no longer moderator of the Presbyterian Grand King. <laughs> I'm glad to be home again. Thanks and uh, appreciation for Jamie and for our brave man and Ray for his leadership. And yeah. 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 really appreciate the good job that you folks are doing in leadership here. And uh, we afford month by month. And to all you folks are coming out here and sharing the good the leadership. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we have felt as Jesus as we've sung together, as we've shared your word together, as we've listened to your spirit, and now as we pray together, we ask that you would show us how to fulfill what Jesus saw as his commission, to proclaim good news, to care for the poor, to release the captives, to restore sight to the blind, and all those things that he saw as his mission and ministry now become our mission and ministry because there, there is a world of hurt in which we live. People who are blind on so many levels, people who are captive to so many forces in their lives, 
and they're looking for a release. And you have called us in the midst of all of this to proclaim the good news and to lift up the year of the Lord's favor. Because we do believe, O oh God, that you created all things good and that you are always continually in the process of recreation and restoring creation to the goodness that you intended. We would pray that you would show us how, as a community of faith together, we might be part of that restoration process. We lift up those within this community who are hurting this day, and we, we lift up especially Bob and Mary Beth and this death that has occurred so suddenly, and pray that you would give them the strength that they need to, to move forward with the, the questions and the concerns and everything surrounding Andrew's passing. Thank you for good friends and a strong support system that is with them. And we're a part of that, O oh Lord, as your spirit works in us and through us. We pray for those who are ailing and fighting off sicknesses tonight, Jan and Shirley and Gail, others that are trying to keep ahead of the flu and regain their health again, O oh Lord, we pray for healing. We pray also for Edith, as she is in her hospice care, in this stage of her life where we know that she's moving closer to being with you. And we also pray for Phyllis and decisions she needs to make as the drug becomes available that might mean healing for her. We pray that if that be the case, that in some way, somehow, financing might become available for her to take advantage of that life-giving drug. It's in your hands, O oh God, and we thank you for the gift of hope you give to us and pray that those hopes might be realized. We give you thanks for the rain that is cleansing, the rain that brings growth, the rain that reminds us that your love pours down upon us just as it rains from the clouds. We give you thanks for this church to which we belong, the ministries that we carry on together within these walls and beyond these walls with other Presbyterian churches throughout the valley, throughout the state of Arizona as we've gathered together to share what we have in common, to lift one another up, and to share a mission and ministry work together. As we move ahead in the future, Lord, that so many times is cloudy and uncertain, we know that we can lean upon you, that your hand is upon us to guide us. In whatever part of that community we find ourselves being active, we thank you for gifts that have been shared tonight, for ministries that are being carried out in your name on all levels and in all areas of this congregation, seen and unseen. We give you thanks for the work of your spirit. Thank you for calling us together tonight. Thank you for the joy that we've experienced, for the encouragement that we've been given by your word and by your spirit. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. And now with one voice we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, captives and recover the sights of the blind, may we do what we can that the oppressed might be set free. And most of all, may we all proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. May the love of God, our Father, and the grace, mercy, and peace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the fellowship and the communion of His Holy Spirit be upon you, now and forevermore. Amen.
Thank you. 